I on behalf of JD Institute of Fashion Technology welcome you all to today's webinar. Our today's webinar is about nature inspired design thinking and we have our key speaker with us Mr. Architect P.S. Chetan. Sir is an architect, educator and a travel enthusiast. He comes with an experience of 22 years in the field of architecture. He is the principal architect of Calm Design and the founder of Humpy Center for Design. He has also been an active part of faculty training program in many design schools. On a very personal note, I have also seen how much interest he takes in involving himself with young minds like us. He has always been a constant support to students who approach him. At his firm Calm Design, they explore ever-changing concepts of space and also the nuances of architectural theory and design. Their ideology has grown to include ecology and sustainable practices. I am proud to tell that it's one of the most aspired architectural firms that people look forward to work for. Humpy Center for Design is a hub for design dialogue and a platform for triggering new thoughts, exploring ideas, envisioning and making. Humpy Center for Design envisions a community for conscious and conscientious designers. Designers who will be a part of the emerging global community and whose actions contribute to building values and practices towards positive impact. It's a fortune that we have a speaker with such a vast experience with us here today. On behalf of the entire JD family, I welcome you, sir. I would also like to extend my warm welcome to the entire JD team present here and the student community. Coming to the today's event, nature has always been a sole inspiration to everything Amanda does. We all have always learned from the nature. Save music, art, dance, art or architecture, everything has begun inspired from the nature. Our design thoughts are influenced by nature and elements around us. Nature has gone through a multiple various cycles and produced designs. Likewise, our design process can also be derived from nature at different stages. Let us know how. Without any further delay, I'll be hand now handing over the platform to Chetan, sir. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you for that um, introduction. It's a pleasure to be on uh, in this August gathering. Uh, and uh, my wishes to all of you. To start off, uh, uh, my prayers and wishes uh, to all of you who face certain challenges at this COVID time. And uh, um, you know, my prayers to all the people who are facing certain challenges at this point of time. I know a few of your relatives, a few of your friends, a few of your family members might be facing this challenge and I'm sure that uh, with positive thought and uh, uh, with the kind of uh, medical care we have at the moment, we shall all pass through this. Um, it's definitely hard times and uh, my prayers are all with, with all of you. At this, but this also gives me an idea as to really understand uh, uh, why have we led ourselves into a situation where uh, we kind of isolate ourselves from, from nature and how can we really relook look at um, uh, how do we learn from nature and use that for our design tools. So what I'll be doing today in the next 45 minutes basically is uh, I'll be doing a part of what we generally do as a workshop activity on design thinking, on nature-inspired design thinking. So I'll be doing a part of it in terms of getting into a query as to why we need to look at nature as an inspiration and uh, how can I um, use certain ideas of nature uh, to come out and solve our day-to-day -day problems. This, uh, this activity of design thinking is not just related to designers, but can be used by professionals from different fields. So I, in fact, uh, in, a, in a couple of interviews, I've even mentioned that uh, design thinking uh, and nature-inspired design thinking will be um, an element in the forefront in literally all boardrooms across various industries. And that's the power of design thinking which we are doing, uh, which we need to get involved with. Myself, architect Chetan Shiva Prasad from Humpy Center of Design. Uh, Humpy Center of Design, a small brief before I start off. Humpy Center of Design is a hub for design dialogue. 
for students of design or, or even professionals of design from across the uh, globe. Uh, we're looking at setting up a center at Humpy, uh, which will inculcate activities, which will inculcate, inculcate workshops, which will inculcate working with the uh, local artisans uh, and various such uh, factors. Our idea is also to bring design to the grassroots levels. So we've been working with uh, various uh, genres of artists and also various uh, levels of the society, um, including craftsmen, where we work with incubating certain uh, craftsmen and doing some very interesting work. So uh, um, I would welcome all of you to be a part of this journey, which we are putting up at Humpy. And I shall have a talk with your management a little later on how we can collaborate on certain activities. So my first question to all of you is, uh, when did you think human beings came on Earth? Uh, if I'm looking at um, the Earth starting at zero hours and uh, today, which is uh, April 2021, we are at 12 o'clock. So which means that the clock has moved one full circle from the time uh, you know, Earth started forming, from the time Earth started forming to where we are. If it's a 12 hour clock, when do you think human beings came onto Earth. I would like you to mention it in the chat box as to when do you think human beings came onto Earth? So Dinesh says uh, human beings came at around 10 o'clock in a 12 hour uh, clock. Somebody says 11.30. Somebody says we are 3 a.m. 30 seconds. Uh, Zulfi Ali sir says uh, 11.59.51. Okay, that's, that's like running too close to the 12 o'clock. Great, someone says nine o'clock. Okay, great. I will just tell you, I think human beings came in the last three seconds ago, which means that human beings were not part of the evolution for the last 11 hours, 59 minutes, 57 seconds of a 12 hour clock of Earth's evolution, which means that we are only a blip in nature's history. Right? If I look at humans' uh, recorded history, we might have a recorded history of, let's say, 50,000 years. 50,000 years is the recorded history which we have. But um, dinosaurs lived for almost 250 million years. They were on this planet for almost 250 million years, right? So the last three seconds of our evolution, of Earth's evolution, is where we are, which means that nature has literally progressed. Do you find anything not beautiful in nature? There's nothing not beautiful in nature. Is there something called waste in nature? There's absolutely nothing called waste in nature. Is there something which is not in place in nature? Everything is organized. Everything works as a system. Everything um, has a process, right? And there's no wastage in it. So which means that if we are creating a lot of wastage today, we still have so much to learn from nature. That's the premise I start off with. Nature has literally faced all the challenges that we are facing today. Literally everything. Just imagine that it's evolved for the last uh, you know, few uh, 4.5 billion years and we have only a 50,000 year of recorded history. And what we hear stories of is hardly 2000 or, or 2000 BC maximum, which is 4,000 years ago. What we know of historically, right? So nature has literally evolved continuously to solve all the challenges it faces. And it is this huge library we have at offer for us to dip in and start looking at how nature has solved that particular problem and try and see if we can look at solutions from that um, uh, and address it in our own way. You've all heard this lovely uh, quote by Charles Darwin, right? What was it called? It was called the theory of evolution. Theory of evolution, Charles Darwin talks about as survival of the fittest is 
the three words we generally use when we talk about theory of evolution. But if I go beyond theory of evolution, beyond those three words, it says he talked not not just to survival of the fittest, but he talked about survival of the fittest by natural selection. What does he mean by this? What does he mean by natural selection? Does nature selectively choose who is strong and who is not strong, and then uh, use them to, for its own benefit? If if I look at uh, human beings, um, Homo sapiens, as we know, that is what we are, right? I can see around six to seven people or eight people on the on who are on screen right now, and all of us are human beings. But if you look at uh, me, I don't have hair on my head. But if I look at Rohit on the screen, he has some thick black hair on his head. Or I look at Prema Jha uh, on the screen. Uh, you know, she has lot of hair on her head, right? So even though all of us are Homo sapiens, each of us has evolved in different ways. Now, if I go back and say, you know, the uh, the way we define our species is. There's a uh, there's a genus and then there's a species. Homo is a genus and the sapiens is a species. So there are many other species of Homos who used to exist before we became prominent, right? So if I look at the other Homos, in fact, uh, we have uh, uh, Homos who are our ancestors who were much taller, much more well built. Then Homo sapiens, but why did Homo sapiens, if they were weaker than the other Homos, why did Homo sapiens grow and literally remove that other uh, other species away from the equation and then come on put themselves into place here? What happened, right? What Charles Darwin also talks about is: is there a possibility of a white crow? There could have been a white crow, but if white crows were so visible for all its predators, if there were ten white crows and then there was one black crow, all the white crows became predated upon, and literally were removed from the equation in due course of time. And we might have only—I mean, I'm just using a metaphor here. We might have just. Had a back one uh, minority of a black crow literally surviving itself and becoming the majority of the species. In one sense, that's what even Homo sapiens have evolved into. Right? There's this uh, beautiful writer. Uh, I think you, all of you should read this book called Space um, Sapiens um, by Yuval Noah uh, Harari, where um, the author talks about the Power of the Homo sapiens to have literally succeeded in removing literally most of the other species was their power to gossip. It's very funny, no? That we are, that he says, or rather, I think she says that sapiens had this power of gossiping, and that's literally took them beyond the level of the other Homos and said that, "What do you mean by gossip?" Because Gossip is the only idea where you believe in things which don't exist. That's what is gossip. If I look at it in in general terms, we gossip about political situations. We gossip about relationships. We gossip about um, the the neighboring neighbor uh, running off with another woman. We literally gossip about things which have not even been existent in front of us. Which meant that, as Homo sapiens, we could visualize a predator attacking us without the predator to be in that place, and for us to visualize that image of a lion attacking us, and then ideating on what we need to do so that we can escape that predator. That's the power of gossip, which literally pushed Homo sapiens beyond the other Homos and made them the, one of the most Superior uh, species of on the planet at this point of time. Uh, today we have one more superior species which is attacking all of us, and it's a single-cell organism, the coronavirus. 
right? And uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm sure Homo sapiens uh, uh, is capable enough of visualizing what can be done with it. And we would take that out of our equation very soon. And I hope it happens soon. Now, uh, did I get my idea of uh, evolution clear to all of you that ev evolution is not just uh, survival of the fittest, but survival of the fittest by natural selection, that nature literally chooses what is right for the equation and starts keeping that into the equation and then slowly removes the other people, right? Similarly, I mean, uh, what it also does is it starts looking at variations. It starts looking at uh, not bringing specialization, but starts looking at creating varieties within the same species. Say, for example, you look at um, um, a cabbage, or you look at a cauliflower, or you look at a spinach, or you look at um, um, pollock. They're all of the same species, which were literally a part of uh, um, you know, a wild grass, which slowly got evolved into different types and ended up being different um, vegetables for all of us. Right? Similarly, you look at uh, how um, nature has, uh, has addressed how um, a caterpillar slowly changes its form and slowly uh, you know, succeeds to become a, um, some kind of a pollinator. Right? There's so many things we need to learn from nature in terms of how it's evolved and created varieties of doing one single job. One more example for all of you is how is flight defined in nature, right? Flying is a very interesting thing in nature, but do all organisms which fly use the same concepts? Do the hummingbird use the same concept of flight like an eagle? If I look at a hummingbird, it literally looks at a rotatory movement of its wings, whereas an eagle or a high-flying bird literally looks at gliding. If you look at birds which uh, move from one continent to other, they look at uh, different kinds of forces where they, they start moving in a V shape, where the thrust, thrust of the first bird is shifted onto the next birds and next birds. So the last bird in the equation is literally, you know, can literally sleep and glide through. And when the first bird gets tired, it drops off and moves to the back and the next bird comes to the front. Some beautiful equations which nature has come out with solving to literally look at one simple idea of a flight. So we, we as human beings at the moment are still looking at two different types of flights. One is of a glider or, or the plane, and the other one is of a chopper, which is a, a rotatory uh, flight. But there are so many more different types of flight we can look at, right? So, these kind of observations, when you go into studying of biology, when you start looking at evolution, when you start looking at uh, nature, we do a small exercise here where we talk about uh, the skill of observation, where we allow people to be, we ask students to go and look out on your own backyards or on your, you know, on your road or whatever, take a spot of one feet by one feet. All of you should try doing this. Take a spot of one feet by one feet, put a ring or something like that around it so that you start focusing only on that one by one grid and start looking at what happens in that one by one grid. You, it might look at a sim, like a simple ground for all of you. Suddenly you will see patterns of grasses. You'll find different patterns of leaves. You'll find ants, you'll find different different types of organisms. You might find an earthworm. You might find different types of uh, stones, grains of stones. And that one feet by one feet literally becomes your world for those 15, 20 minutes. And our learning from that one feet by one feet is humongous. To literally say, I can I look at that one feet by one feet and I can, can I start looking at designing a process for myself, for my organism? Can I create a, a process for financial management in a company, or can I create a jewelry? Can I create a space in architecture? Can I create a structural system? Can I create 
uh, a fashion accessory. So many things can happen in that one feet by one feet. And that is what we start need to start looking at when we start looking at nature. But why do we need to look at nature? We are already designing something very interesting. All of us are designing. I mean, we all have phones, right? We all use phones. And we know that uh, whatever latest we have uh, at, in our hands is already outdated in some other place of the world, right? So we are always a developing thing, uh, you know, organism. We know that we can create a lot more of things continuously. And we are a, today we are a highly consumerist society, right? We consume so much of resources. And uh, why, why should I look at another process where... You know, when I'm already creating so many new things continuously. This is where I come across uh, this beautiful book by uh, these two uh, gentlemen, Michael, uh, I, I'm bad at uh, pronouncing names, Michael Braungart and William McDonough. Uh, these two guys uh, wrote this beautiful book called Cradle to Cradle, where they really look at uh, how we work on a very linear process of consumption versus where nature literally looks as a circular way of consumption. Okay, I will want. I would want to draw your attention to certain um, uh, examples which I'll be showing here, um, especially of one. This is one example which I'm showing you where there's this artist called Chris Jordan, and uh, these works were done somewhere uh, way early in the early two uh, thousands. And these are certain works and definitely where we have consumed, uh, you know, uh, the world has moved to another level. But let us look at statistics. This piece of art where he plonked around 4,26,000 cell phones in uh, one place. And he said, he asked people to look at it. And it's huge. Just look at that mass of cell phones, which is lying on that ground there. And that was the number of cell phones which was being retired from the United States alone every single day. This was the number of cell phones we were sell, which we were putting into a landfill on a continuous basis on, a, on every single day. And this is something we need to really look at. Uh, there's more examples of Chris Jordan. Uh, I will share that with you. But if you can look at, if you can make a note of this artist's work, you will see the impact uh, we all have been doing to our own earth. Um, There's another amazing example, lovely painting, a uh, lovely piece of art. Um, but this piece of art was done out of 2,40,000 plastic bags. This piece of art was done by 2,40,000 uh, plastic bags which was almost spanning eight feet by 13 feet in, as a canvas. Eight feet by 13 feet was the canvas size, right? And this was a number of plastic bags which was consumed in the world in every 10 seconds. And this was something which was presented in 2009 as a piece of art. And we are now in 2021. So easily we would have gone 10 times higher than what we, are, what we see here. Which means today we might be literally putting out around 24 lakh plastic bags out into the landfill on, a, on, a, on every 10 seconds. Well, would that shock you? Because uh, we mindlessly remove every plastic which we take out uh, and literally put it into our land, into our dustbin, which ends up into a landfill. Uh, I was looking at uh, uh, another beautiful uh, documentary on, uh, on television, which talked about is plastic a boon or a bane for, for human society? It has been a boon in many ways. It has been a boon in many ways. Uh, if not for plastic, we would not be having cars uh, which were weighing so less. We would not have the kind of transportation systems we have today. We would not have our lives as simple as we have today. We would not have the mobile phones which we are, you know, where we are interacting today um, without this plastic. But are we using it sensibly? Are we producing it sensibly? Are we using 
it sensibly? Are we conscious of that? Is a, is a question we need to look at. So sometimes it's a boon, sometimes it's a bear. So how do we address all of this? Right? Can we do our lives without plastic? Is another big question. I, mean, I can't. I can't lead my life without plastic today. But I can I drink milk with plastic you know, you know, uh, uh, elements in it? Unfortunately, we all know that we are having uh, you know, those polymers inside our milk, which we get today. And we, we can't do anything. We can't help ourselves. Every, uh, there's a statistic somewhere I was hearing, every cow in Bangalore city has at least 30 cages of plastic in its stomach because it goes and grazes itself in the dustbin where we throw our plastics unnecessarily. This is a close-up uh, image of that painting uh, where you can see the plastic cars. So if I'm really calculating how much of waste we generate as, uh, as a human being, we literally generate around 102 tons of waste per person per you know, in, in their lifetime, which means that we're not sending, we don't need just a three feet by six feet space for our self for our grave, but we need 11, uh, uh, 100, 1,100 such graves for us to say that we are not anymore on this planet. It's something which we are really concerned, right? It is something which, uh, you know, we need to really understand, is this the kind of uh, consumption we need to get into? Is there another way out of this without literally changing our lifestyle? So this is the uh, linear system in which we are working. Are you all able to see my slides? Right. Um, this is the linear way of leading our lives right now where we talk about ready to grip, uh, which means that uh, everything we, uh, we extract has to come from one source, right? Everything we we start producing has to come from one source and that source is mother earth. We, we can't get anything else from somewhere else, right? Whatever product things we produce has to come from mother earth, whether it's a pen, whether it's a mobile phone, whether it's our laptop, whether it's uh, a paper, whether it's pen, whether it's glasses, everything, whatever we use today, whether it's food, everything has to come from mother earth. Right? So, in this linear process, we take things out of Mother Earth. We start taking things out of Mother Earth. We start processing it. We start designing things out of it. We start manufacturing those uh, products. Could be a built space, could be an interior space, could be a, a jewelry, could be a, a fabric, whatever. We start creating uh, this beautiful stuff as designers. And then we send it out to the market. Right? The market uses that I'm talking to all of you as designers. As we design, we send it out to the market and the market starts using that whole thing. And after its life, after it's finished its life, what do we do? We send it out either. If some there are some people who are sensible and they say, okay, let me recycle this part. Let me not just throw this pen after I finish this ink. Let me buy another cartridge and refill this and start using it some more time. But how many of us do this? we end up throwing it back into our landfill. We end up throwing, okay, this doesn't work. Let me throw it into the dustbin. I'm not saying all of you. I mean, a lot of us do this. We send everything, whatever comes into our hand, what happens to it is we end up throwing it into our landfill. And this is a very linear process which talks about cradle to grave. And that's the cause of concern. I'll give you a simple example. All of you have got laptops, right? How much do our laptops weigh? Can we get some answers on the chat box? How much do our and, uh, uh, laptops weigh in weight? Two kgs, two and a half kgs, 2.15 kgs, three kgs, four kgs, one and a half kgs. Soon we'll have one, one and a half kgs, things like that, 900 grams and things like that, right? But do you know how much of resources is taken out from Earth to produce that two kgs of, of a laptop? 
approximately around 13 kgs, 13,000 kgs is what we take out to manufacture that laptop. Right. So what we, what we take out from Mother Earth is around 13,000 kgs and what we use out of that is around two and a half kgs and the rest we throw it back into the landscape. We need to be conscious of this process. And as designers, I'm happy to I'm happy to be talking to a group of designers here. We as designers have to be very conscious. Are you all familiar with the five R's, which we do so that we say we can save nature? I'll come back to that question a little later. Five R's which we use. Can somebody type some of the R's? Reduce, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Refuse, many of those, right? But you know what is the most important thing? The, the top, whatever we are writing out here, refuse, reduce, reincarnation, whatever is a solution for the crisis we have already put to ourselves. So whatever we have created, it's a solution to delay the product reaching out to our landfill. You know, the most important thing, the most important R lies in the people in the room today is to redesign. It is time that we start redesigning processes in a way that it is not linear, that it does not follow a cradle to grave concept. I will introduce you to this uh, word. Uh, how many of you know what Earth Overshoot Day means? We all know Earth Day. We all know Earth Hour, right? How many of you know what is an Earth Overshoot Day? If somebody wants to unmute themselves and speak it out, it will be great. Any of you know what is an Earth Overshoot Day? Earth Overshoot Day is the day we start consuming more than the what, what the earth is reproducing per year in that particular year. Which means, I'll give it to you in simple words. I'll give it to you in monetary words. Say I would want, uh, I would want to keep a deposit in the bank and I decide to keep 100 rupees of deposit in the bank. Right? And the bank says, every year I'll start giving you one rupee interest from this hundred rupee um, amount you have kept into the bank. Right? So how much can I remove every year from that bank so that the principal amount does not change? How much money can I remove? I need you to enter in the chat. Per year we can only... Sorry? Per year, we can only remove one rupee. Right? We can't remove one rupee, one paisa. The moment I start removing one rupee, one paisa, the principal amount goes down. My interest for the next year comes down. Instead of one rupee, I, instead of getting one rupee as interest, I start getting 99 paisa. Approximately, I'm just giving you an idea. Do you get this idea? Similarly, Earth is a bank of resources for us. And Earth has a capacity to replenish itself, be it in terms of water, be it in terms of crops, be it in terms of minerals, be it in terms of energy, whatever. Right? In 1985 or 86 onwards, we started taking one rupee, one paisa from the bank. Which meant that I started borrowing uh, money which does not belong to me, which does not belong to me for that year, which belongs to me for, a, for the future years. I start taking one rupee, one paisa. Right? So today, as of today, in 2021, we finished consumption of 2021 on August 22nd. After August 22nd, whatever I'll be consuming 
literally belongs to another era which literally means that it belongs to my children or my grandchildren or my great grandchildren i've started consuming resources of them for my benefit today. and that's a huge cause of concern and at this pace at which we are moving we are sure by 2030 we would have reached june 30th we would have reached the which means that by june 30th i would have consumed this year's resources and on june 20th 30th i will be using resources of the next generation what does that mean that by 2030 i will need two earths to survive because june 30th is the middle of the year by 2030 i will need two earths to survive do we have two earths to survive we don't right we just have one earth to survive right today if everybody in the world starts living like an american if everyone starts living like an american we need seven earths we already need seven earths if everybody starts living like middle class indian we need 1.8 earths it's these are certain things which are of concern right and these are not statistics which i have made up these are statistics released by the global footprint network which is a united nations um, you know defined program i have a small video for all of you to look at which can just talk to you about what does this mean hi alex here happy earth of bushu day is the audio clear well there's nothing happy about it really this year earth of bushu day falls on august the 1st the earliest day ever never heard of earth of bushu day or the ecological footprint our ecological footprint is how much we demand from nature currently humanity is using the equivalent of 1.7 planets Every year, Global Footprint Network calculates Earth Overshoot Day. It marks the date when humanity's demand on nature exceeds what Earth can regenerate in that year. In 2018, Earth Overshoot Day falls on August the 1st. You can think about this as a bank account. For the first 7 months and 1 day in 2018, we lived on our regular salary. After that, we start chipping into our savings and racking up credit card debt. Hmm, seems like there's something wrong with that math. The ecological footprint measures how much land and water area we need to produce the resources we use, things like food, land for settlements, timber, seafood, and to absorb the waste and carbon dioxide we generate. Our biocapacity is the amount of biologically productive areas such as forests, fishing grounds, crop and grazing areas that are available to provide the resources we use and to absorb our waste. we can compare footprint and biocapacity to see if we are well balanced or not why do we care about humanity's ecological footprint the cost of ecological overspending are evident every day in the form of deforestation drought biodiversity loss and the build up of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere ecological overspending can also put nations at more economic risk without sufficient resources it is hard to operate an economy or we have to import more which has cost as well Carbon emissions from fossil fuel use are a big part of today's footprint. Today, humanity's carbon footprint makes up 60% of the world's total ecological footprint. Individuals can measure their own ecological footprint with Global Footprint Network's new calculator. Mine is 3.5 global hectares. In fact, you can even calculate the date of your own overshoot day. the day when the world would go into ecological overshoot if everyone on the planet lived like you. If your overshoot day falls before August the 1st, that means your ecological footprint is larger than the world average. You can learn more about sustainability solutions by joining the Earth Overshoot Day hashtag Move the Date campaign. Make steps to take actions to move back the date of Earth Overshoot Day and share them in the calculator with your friends and family. If we can move the date of overshoot day 5 days per year, we will be living sustainably on our one planet Earth by 2050. Help move the date, calculate your own ecological footprint and overshoot day today. Visit www.overshootday.org. This video was created in collaboration with Global Footprint Network 
an international think tank that coordinates research, develops methodological standards, and provides decision makers with tools to help the human economy operate within Earth's ecological limits. I hope you enjoyed this video. After subscribe, if you do, click on the little bell beside the subscription button to receive notifications when we post a new video. Great. Um, I think all of you should try out looking at your own footprints at earthorshootday.org and see where we stay uh, uh, today. Okay. Uh, so I, I will not go more in terms of Earth Orshoot. I think I, I touched upon that. Uh, in this. So I would want to ask you a question. Okay? I, uh, and I want you to write down in the chat box, who do you think is responsible? for whatever we are doing. Who is responsible for Earth Overshoot Day today? Can we get a little bit more specific in terms of saying we? We as human beings? Are we as human beings responsible? I would, I would defer with all of you. I would say, I would definitely agree with the first part of it that we said we are responsible. Uh, but I would differ with you as uh, saying that humans as a whole are responsible. I think we as designers in the room are responsible. Because if we can design objects, if we can design spaces, if we can design um, processes where we don't have to consume so much of this from Earth. We don't have to create materials which finally end up into a landfill. If we design products which does not require 10,000 kgs of material from planet Earth to do a 2 kg product, if we can design, we can minimize the Earth overshoot day and slowly move towards a sustainable future. So I think a, a beautiful quote by um, Al Alistair Ford, designers actually have more potential to slow environmental degradation than economists, politicians, and environmentalists. Their, their power is catalytic. And I think I, it's nice that we are talking to a group of young designers uh, and on your shoulders, um, you know, we need to move on in terms of saying, can we design something much better for, with relation to nature? Okay. So how do we do it? How do designers, how can we as designers learn is to start looking at how nature does it. And when we start learning from nature as to how nature does it, it becomes very, very interesting for us to take, go on to that journey. Right? So going back uh, to that book, Cradle to Cradle, they talked about nature following this idea of cradle to cradle. There's nothing called birth and stagnation in nature. Cradle to grave. There's always cradle to cradle, which means that what was born in nature finally ends up as food for another process. Even the human body after death becomes food for the organisms that are buried. Right? Or even whatever, man, uh, sorry to use, but whatever we eat ends up as, a, as an organic matter which gets devoured by insects. As, right? Or becomes um, uh, you know, manure for plants to grow. It becomes a very cyclical process. It becomes a very, uh, you know, birth to birth process. So there's nothing which is called waste in nature. That's what, that's the beauty in nature. There's nothing called waste in nature. What gets generated ends up as food for something else in nature. Okay. That is what cradle to cradle literally talks about. Um, I will not go into this video because this video will take us some more time and I think we're already running behind, way behind schedule. More and more. So these are certain rules which we've looked at how nature solves our design problems. Nature uses only the energy it needs and relies on freely available energy around it. 
nature recycles all materials nature is resilient to disturbances nature tends to optimize rather than maximize nature provides mutual benefit nature runs on information nature uses chemistry and materials that are safe well life uh, living beings nature builds using abundant resources incorporating rare resources only sparingly each of this are are subjects which we end up discussing in our workshops and independent groups and uh, learnings are huge nature is locally attuned and responsive nature uses shape to determine functionality and these are certain core rules of nature which helps nature not create waste which looks at this cyclical process um okay i will come back to this question a little later i will go into certain examples of how people looked at uh, nature and came out with design solutions right one favorite example has been the bullet train right you earlier the bullet train had a very blunt facade had a blunt face so whenever it used to go into a tunnel of air if it went into a tunnel of air the air density outside was much lighter than the air density inside of inside a tunnel so it, uh, the train itself was banging itself into a wall of air right so what it did was when it hit into a wall of air it created some kind of a drag the air started pushing the the train behind so the speed reduced and it also created something called sonic boom which was a loud sound which used to disturb its surroundings right so what the engineer started looking at was one of the inspirations they looked at was the kingfisher's beak the kingfisher when it flies and starts looking at fish in the water when it puts its beak into the water this you will see the second image in the three images when it puts its big beak into the water it does not disturb the surface of the water it very fluidly goes inside that water picks its fish and comes out right and what they did was they took this beak of the kingfisher and put it as the nose of a blood train made it into nose of blood train and what did it do it literally removed the sonic boom it kept i mean today we have bullet trains which run at 600 km per hour this is certain inspirations i'm not going to cradle to cradle here but i'm looking at inspirations of how nature has been used to solve their day to day problems right so if this is one such example um a lizard how does it walk on all surfaces how can it walk on a on glass how can it walk on the ceiling it is because of this uh, at, uh, you know two things where you look at the macro at the nano level it has tubular structures which create some kind of a vacuum tube and also the circular base is made up of hairline uh, structures which allow it to peel itself off immediately so if you know how vacuum works you would all have that angles or that uh, arrows which you have played as kids where you pull that arrow and throw it it had a vacuum uh, you know ending and it used to go and stick onto a wall but it was very difficult for us to peel it out we had to pull it out at one end and come out but what the lizard does is it has micro uh, microbial hair at its edges of that vacuum tube which allows it to peel itself so there is people have come out with uh, gecko tapes which are used in aero uh, aero uh, aeronautic industries uh, or chocolate technologies which looks at how the shark moves and re redesigning swimwear based on those fin structure or the, or the the cell shark structures of the of the shark and uh, one the first time it was used it was used by michael philip in the australian olympic games where we he ended up winning i think 10 gold medals in that one olympic games and part of it he definitely said is for the swimwear and that is what is being used for swimmers across the globe today um some more concept cars by mercedes benz using the box fish uh, as an idea where uh, in terms of creating a larger space and minimizing damage when hit um by using the skeletal structure of the fish 
uh, you would all have seen the lotus, even though it stays in a, a dirty pond, is always clean. It is because of this small, minute bumps on the surface of the lotus leaf, which allows water to roll off and carry dirt, dirt along with it and clean itself. Today, you have uh, uh, paints which are designed in similar fashion, which does not even allow microbial bacteria to sit on, which is used for painting clean rooms in hospitals and research institutions. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, structured lights. Structured light is uh, what um, the, the geometry of a surface of, one of, the, of any of these insects or butterflies work um, in terms of reflecting only the required light color. So uh, if you say apple is red in color, it is everything other than red in color because it is, absorbs all the other colors and only reflects red in color, reflects the red outside. So it throws red outside for us to see, but it absorbs literally all the other colors, right? So using that as a concept, um, the way we design our own system, the way we our mobiles are designed today, to the way our um, laptops are designed or the TVs are designed, where you can you can just have a five mm screen which reflects, you know, images at that high high quality of reflection is all understood from structured lightings, structured uh, colors from butterflies, beetles, uh, peacocks, and shells, and things like that. I've, there's a lot more examples, so I'll just run through the whales, which help us uh, design windmills, um, and hills, which help us design buildings to keep it cool at a constant temperature. Uh, some people who went on to getting inspired structurally and said, can I look at structure and create uh, beautiful structures out of it, beautiful build forms out of it. Santiago Calatrava, an architect who looked at uh, uh, you know, the, hu the human body, the turning torso, the eye, or various such things to kind of design um, very interesting uh, architectural expressions. Some of people who've looked at um, creating structures which can even degenerate and things like that. This is something we we were working on in one of our projects where we were looking at designing a kindergarten and we said the kindergarten somewhere uh, needs to start looking at uh, the way the shell works. Uh, at the same time, need to look at how a egg egg shell works and said that the kindergarten is where the the child literally breaks open its safe cocoon or safe egg and comes out into the world of it. And we started looking at the structural systems of the of the shell and came out with the design for a kindergarten. And we built this kindergarten in Bangalore uh, using this concept where we use very thin uh, 15 mm thick, 15 uh, mm thick shells to span literally around 40, 45 feet. Uh, and at the same time, create some kind of interesting language of light and play of geometry for the kindergarten. Now how, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example of how we can look at nature as designers. Can we look at nature and the way nature looks at geometry to solve all its day-to-day -day problems? Um, the way nature looks at growth uh, using helix, the movement of helix to grow, to create spir uh, spirals, to create uh, uh, DNA structures, to create uh, um, you know, winders, growth in the barks and things like that. Uh, how it looks at creating um, resilience, strength, uh, the, the known you know, uh, composition of a web in terms of saying that a spider's web is one of the most beautifully uh, strong tensile membrane ever found in nature. We have uh, spiders which can throw out webs 25 meters across, which is almost 75, 80 feet across, and literally capture flying birds in its own web and start eating them. Right? So kind of, just look at the kind of impact these uh, webs can hold and how this, if when used in, in an architectural language, can change the way we look at steel as a construction material. Um, just imagine putting one steel and the whole slab works on that one steel structure. Um, 
conic sections used right across um, the flow, the, par the parabolic curve, the hyperbolic curve, uh, the ellipse, the circle used continuously in nature to create movement. Um, again, another conic of waves. Uh, as as you know, how can we learn from all of this? How can we learn from the conic sections? How can we learn from the waves to create our own unique uh, things? How can I look at a conic section and say this is the lightest material I can use to create the same kind of geometry? Uh, we had uh, one one great architect called uh, Santo Anthony Gaudi who 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 is designed a structure which is being built for the last 250 years using simple uh, parabolic curves uh, and uh, simple sandbanks to hold it and designed it. And it's a marvelous piece of architecture. How can we learn from geometries like the uh, honeybee uh, on how it stores honey you know, in the most compact way? So uh, we need to get into this query of saying, what can a cluster of dandelions teach us about space exploration? There has been people who have looked at dandelions and said, can we look at space exploration using this as an idea? How can help owls help us build quieter wind turbines? If you know how a owl uh, moves, you will know that it does. It has zero decibels of sound when it flaps its wings. How, how can we learn from an owl to do that? How can ants teach us about optimization? How can butterflies help us design mobile phones with longer battery life? So um, I will I will jump into a gist of what is design thinking. Design thinking was a, uh, was a process introduced by the Stanford University. It said that let us look at how designers think and solve problems, and can we bring that design thinking process onto solving our everyday problem statement? And they came up with this lovely idea of saying, breaking it down into five uh, major categories and said, can we empathize? Can we understand the people who are facing these problems and start empathizing them to really understand what the problem is? And the next is to literally define what the problem statement means, right? And the third one is to ideate on that problem statement and come up with their own design solutions. That's what we all do, right? Whenever we get a design problem, we start looking at site, we start looking at analyzing the site, we start looking at where the wind moves and things like that. We start empathizing with the site. We start empathizing with the client's requirement. We start empathizing in, with the client's dreams and saying that, okay, if this are the client's dream and then start defining what the problem we need to solve, right? And then we come out and design and ideate and come out with design solutions. We would, be it designing a jewelry or be it designing an interior space or an architecture space. This is the process which we follow. We ideate and come out with some kind of a design process. And then we create a product out of it. Um, when you're looking at it at different levels, you create prototypes out of it. You create prototypes and then you test that prototype. And you know that that prototype sometimes fails in certain ideas. So you go back and iterate on either redefining the problem statement or you go back and re-empathize on, on the problem people are facing. So this was a non-linear process which Stanford University came out with and said that this is design thinking. So what we do in nature-inspired design thinking is to break the definition of the problem statement furthermore and said that rather than just defining, this is a very human-centric you know, design problem uh, process where we design purely for the human beings. We don't really look at the world in, at large, we don't look at trend to trend, we don't look at cyclical process systems. So when we said that, how can I include the process of the cyclical process into this uh, design thinking activity, we, we tweaked this design process a few ways and which has helped us literally work with various genres, be it financial managers, be it um, man marketing people, be it designers, be it product designers, be it architects, be it, we have started re-looking at what is that we have done is basically we have taken the problem definition further and said that rather than just saying that how can we solve this particular problem, we start adding another level to it and said that how does nature 
So we change certain equation and I will give you certain examples later on rather than saying how can we solve this problem, we say we start re redefining that problem statement and said how does nature, how does nature transfer loads, how does nature carry water, how does nature stabilize, how does nature communicate, many such questions we start generating and we start building, we create another vertical here and said let's build a design matrix because for a simple problem which, which could mean that how does nature stabilize, I might find a problem solution coming from a single cell bacteria to a well. Both of them could be solving problems for me in different ways. So I build a huge design matrix using the various design inquiries we get, go into nature and build a design matrix and use the design matrix to come and ideate on the design solution. So you're not literally removing nature from the equation, but making nature a partner of your design process. And that's what we do in this nature inspired design thinking activity. So this is one workshop which we did where we are talking about uh, how can we create a multi-use self-cleaning attire that is environmentally friendly. This is a problem statement somebody came out with and said, how can we? That was the definition of problem statement. Then slowly when we went into how does nature, uh, we started questioning uh, organisms, we started questioning uh, um, um, leaves, we started questioning bees in terms of saying, hello bee, how, does, how do you do this? And build this whole matrix of how does it do it? And uh, We kind of create a design sketch or a visual sketch of how that bee solves self-cleaning mechanisms. And saying that if I if the bee does it, how can I use it as a design process? And uh, the team ended up designing as an ideation process certain uh, clothes. So you also go into empathy part where we start looking at uh, how does the user work with it, things like that. I could just touch upon the very brief of what we are talking about in terms of nature inspired design. We continuously do workshops. I will be talking with uh, your college and see whether we can have a longer workshop for literally doing this whole exercise of getting into building the design matrix. Uh, for a lot of people who have attended this, uh, this activity, they found that the building the design matrix has been life-changing for them in terms of how they approach design, uh, problem solving in design. Uh, because suddenly they find um, simple organisms like bacteria giving them ideas or uh, um, an insect giving them an idea or a whale giving them an idea or a bird giving them an idea or a, a process in nature like evaporation giving them an idea of how to solve the problem in a much more environmentally conscious way. Right? So we do have one workshop coming up on the 7th, 8th and 9th of uh, uh, May uh, in the lockdown. So if anyone's interested, uh, you can get my details from Rohit or something or I can leave it uh, on the chat box for you to um, get in touch with us. Um, I would definitely um, like if any of you are interested in understanding this process, you can join us for this workshop. Um, sorry, uh, Roy, I will just take one more minute of my yes, We sir. also, through Humpy Center of Design, we also have this very interesting workshop or a, a design digest where we send you emails out for 101 days where each day we introduce you to a designer, we introduce you to one interesting place of architecture or craft in India. We take you down on its history. We give you a small design activity to practice. So if any one of you are interested, you can uh, use your phone's QR code scanner uh, and scan this uh, code and uh, you, know, uh, you can join us for this workshop. There's a small fee attached to it. It's around 499 rupees for the 101 days of emails. These are certain things which we are doing so that we can bring design to the general public. So it is not just open for designers, but it's open for your uncles, aunts, brothers, cousins, sisters, everybody, whoever is own, even non-designers. Um, with that, uh, I think I hand it back to the Rohit uh, for any Q&A sessions. I just wanted to know what is the material that is used for the kindergarten uh, that roofing. Yeah, um, we were very conscious of uh, how we are addressing it. So uh, it's a ferro cement structure, but uh, we, we reduce the material consumption by almost one sixth uh, 
required consumption. Uh, so by creating a cell structure which could use only 15 centimeters of thickness, number one. We designed another, their primary school also, where we looked at the tree and uh, we said, uh, how can we look at a tree and uh, how can we look at load transfer because it was a mobile structure. Another thing is uh, both the kindergarten and the school is uh, buildings which can be moved, which can be shifted. So almost 80% of that building can be shifted to another place. So uh, uh, the other, the school which we designed, we inclined the columns rather than keeping it vertical. And by inclining the columns inward and outward, we managed to reduce steel consumption by almost 40%. Um, so I, I would really say uh, we're, we're uh, already into a cradle to cradle model. We're still on a cradle to grave model, but uh, a cradle to cradle idea is, is very conceptual at this point of time. But I, I see that as a very strong requirement for the young minds in the room today. Because when you start practicing, I think we will need to move towards a cradle to cradle idea of everything we, we design. Yes. So there's a question from Aishwarya. Yeah. She's asking that you said there are many uh, nature inspired things. Were all of them uh, sustainable or were made sustainable? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, as I rightly said, I mean, cradle to cradle is still a conceptual level. Okay. Uh, there has been quite a big, big uh, growth in the way we've been looking at cradle to cradle. Cradle to cradle is the only sustainable path. Okay, whatever we are doing otherwise, even in terms of saying, I'm looking at rammed earth constructions, if I'm looking at uh, steel structures or whatever, we might be conscious. Okay, we might be conscious. We are looking at abstracts. I mean, even the examples which we talked about in terms of the bullet train or uh, the swimwear or the lotus paint or whatever is where we are looking at strategies in nature and using that. So we are looking at only one part of nature and using better benefits of that for designing uh, uh, objects or products. We still haven't gone much deeper into it. I mean, I would definitely love, uh, before I, I leave this earth, I would love to design a building which can kill itself after its usage. There should not be a a ruin of that building uh, um, after that building's usage is finished. That would be my dream as an architect to design. We still are uh, far way ahead, but yeah, I think that's that's the path we need to take. It's still not sustainable. There's nothing called sustainability. In, we are more conscious. If somebody is saying we are sustainable, we are more conscious. It's another question. How do we develop nature-inspired thinking for any design development? Where do we start? I think the starting point is observation. Um, um, we need to have an eye. Um, I mean, there's one activity which we do uh, in the live workshops where we ask people to go out and we give them five minutes to get around, um, say around 10 objects. And uh, simple things could be like, get me a, a leaf which has five corners. And they find it very they find it very difficult when they're in the inside the classroom. But they within 10 minutes they get all those five to ten minutes, they get all those objects back. So that act of observation of things which is just outside your room, which will give you answers, is the first step toward nature inspired design thinking. How can designers influence the policy makers for more sustainable practices in each country and its policies? Yeah, I mean, um, can you can you repeat that question again? I put here policy. How can designers influence the policy makers for more sustainable practices in each country? By designers getting into politics. If, because I think uh, uh, even though designers, I mean, I know a lot of designers, architects, planners, 
who given in pro policy proposals but unfortunately it lands on to a person who does not understand that language and uh, uh, there i mean the and it goes into the dustbin just because they don't understand the language so i think uh, for policies on sustainability to happen we need designers in the field of politics too that's my personal approach lastly there's one student asking if there's one advice you can give for the young designers like us um i would say uh, work with hope uh work with consciousness in terms of uh, being aware of what you're doing um i'm aware that i'm not environmentally conscious when i'm designing my buildings but i'm aware that uh, we as in ev in india consume 6000 i mean sorry 15000 hectares of top soil every year to make bricks we use 15000 hectares of top soil to make bricks in india so i am aware of that so i use bricks which consume one sixth of the top soil even though that is not environmentally friendly i use a brick which uses one sixth of the top soil to build the same structure so thereby i'm more conscious of what i'm doing i think the first level of being a, a, a good designer is about being conscious of what you're doing so i would say be conscious when you're using any material or process and is it practically uh, possible for us to attain a 100% sustainability through design it is definitely possible um it would take time um, but i think we need we need a lot of lot of people to move towards literally looking at how nature has solved problems because nature is 100% sustainable and if i can start looking at every aspect of nature and start looking at using that as a process design process we can do amazing stuff i mean yesterday i was looking at a, a video a documentary on origami uh, and uh, you know we look at origami as a piece of art we look at origami as something where uh, we design uh, cranes and masks and things like that but nature as a rule uses this idea of folding and unfolding continuously for everything say for example if it didn't use the idea of a fold it we couldn't have a brain which could store so much of documentation if you look at the geometry of a brain it's a series of valleys and mountains and because it's this process of valleys and mountains the number of neurons which the brain has increases the capacity of of, of knowledge uh, you know documentation within the brain right or our intestine or any of our organs right so nature continuously looks at origami as an idea i think we are coming to the end of today's session sir i'd like to thank uh, our today's speaker mr chetan for making time between all his busy schedules and accepting our request to share a little of his knowledge with our students today it was a great talk and i'm pretty sure uh, it has helped a lot of our students and they can take back something and use that in their design process thank you so much sir on behalf of the entire college and we really look forward to engage ourselves in the workshops in your future so sure. thank you thank you thank you everyone for being part of this uh, i hope all of you enjoyed this and uh, all the very best i would also like to thank the entire management team of jd institute especially nilesh sir zulfi sir and pramod sir for being a constant support and providing us a platform even during the pandemic to do such an event i should also thank the pr team for being here with us today extended thanks to the entire team for his work towards making this event happen lastly my sincere thanks to all the faculty and student presence here we have many more such inspiring and amazing talks and events coming up please do watch out our space for more updates thank you and have a great week